Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Agrin, and I serve on the Historic Preservation Commission uh, for Iowa City. I represent the Northside neighborhood, and we have um, commission members from uh, all the various districts across the city, as well as some at-large members. Uh, tonight uh, is a really fun night because we get to celebrate the stewardship of historic buildings in our community and the people who own them and have worked on them uh, with great care uh, and investment. Uh, the buildings honor our heritage while continuing to serve in our community as valuable structures. And these living, breathing buildings uh, add to the character of our neighborhoods and to our city and community as a whole. Uh, before we get to the awards, I'll... Uh, highlight just a few of our preservation successes and commission news. So bear with me because it's been a, a busy year. Uh, this summer, we thanked and thank again in this moment uh, four outgoing members of the commission, Ginnelly Swaim, Frank Wagner, Pam Michaud, and Esther Baker, who served a combined 53 years uh, for the commission and for the city. This fall, we got the results of a survey of downtown's historic inventory and started a community conversation about how to create an environment to preserve these historic resources in our downtown area as our urban fabric evolves over time. We have five new Iowa City landmarks, bringing our total to 52, and we'll likely have two more uh, in the matter of a month. Soon, the thoughtfully and well illustrated on this slide, um, and skillfully restored old settlers' cabins will reopen in City Park. The Iowa City Public Library added to their great resources of local history by adding a digital searchable database of historic Iowa City newspapers. The former Unitarian Universalist Church at 10 South Gilbert, which is a local landmark, has joined Iowa City's inventory of buildings listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The Iowa Federation Home at 942 Iowa Avenue, the Tate Arms House at 914 South Dubuque, and the Bortz House at 416 Reno Street have also been nominated for listing. Several grant projects are underway, including a study of the historic house at Friendly Farm, a study to preserve the Summit Street marker, uh, which uh, marked the uh, southeast, I think that there's a typo on this, southeast extent of the original city limits, and a nomination of the Clinton Street and Railroad Depot District for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. There's, of course, always more work to do. Uh, an update that there are plans that will displace the Sanxia Gilmore House at 109 Market Street. It's the oldest house in the original city limits, uh, built as the old capital is being constructed. We're un currently undergoing a study to determine a relocation plan and find a new location for the house. And surely, as history tells us, another preservation project is always just around the bend. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to help get the word out about an the new Iowa City Matters podcast, the first episode on historic preservation, uh, which is about a 45 minute, I think, uh, uh, discussion that kind of dives into a little bit deeper than we often have the opportunity to. Um, the issues of historic preservation in, in our community um, is up there, and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts, uh, as NPR says, uh, or icgov.org slash Iowa City Matters. Uh, it was fun to produce, and I hope it's enjoyable and informative to listen to, and as a participant in the first episode, I'd like to express my appreciation for Jack Brooks and uh, Jack Brooks' editing skills and making it sound uh, smooth and slick. So uh, anyway, tonight is about the on-ground and on-scaffolding work that has been done in our community and recognizing the award winners who have undertaken these projects. So thank you for your work, and I'd like to invite the formidable Maeve Clark up to talk from the perspective of Friends of Historic Preservation. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you for joining us tonight in celebrating the 36th Annual Awards, a joint project of the city's Historic Preservation Commission and the nonprofit Friends of Historic Preservation. This is one of my favorite programs in Iowa City every year, and I'm so glad you're here with us. My name is Maeve Clark. I am a new and past board member of Friends. We have some other new board members for Friends, Ginny Lee Swain, former chair of the commission, Bob Micklow, retired city planner, Michael Burt, who managed the sal salvage barn much earlier, as well as Bridget and Dan Matheson, who have also come on board. We join Terry Phillips, Paul Wittow, Tom Baldridge, Sandra, Sandra Johnson, and Ben Sandell. This is my little speech to get you guys enthused about Friends of Historic Preservation. Being a board member has been a wonderful, fulfilling volunteer position. There is, of course, much work to do, but it's also a tremendously positive way to help preserve Iowa City's history and to be an advocate. 
This is also a great way to meet like-minded folks and to have fun to boot. There's always fun. Well, almost always. <laughs> I encourage you, I encourage anyone interested in Friends of Historic Preservation to speak to any one of our board members. This past year has been one of ongoing projects and renewal. But first, I would like to express our appreciation to Alicia Trimble. Last spring, Alicia moved on to other endeavors, and we thank her for her many years as Executive Director of Friends. Our work on the 1890s Hauser Metzger House continued throughout 2018 because of the commitment of Board President Terry Phillips, Carpenter Mike Marini, and countless volunteers. Everyone who was part of saving this 50-ton gem from the landfill deserves thanks, especially the City of Iowa City for help with the move from Iowa Avenue to the College Green Historic District and to Midwest One Bank for financing. We are happy to say that we look forward to a Hauser Metzger house finding a single family owner very soon. Our salvage barn on Scott Boulevard continues to sell salvaged and donated historically appropriate building materials and items to members and non-members alike. Our tool library allows members to borrow a tool rather than buy something you might only need once. The tool library is one of our most popular benefits and sometimes sparks a lifelong passion for restoration. A huge thank you to Audrey Keith, who manages our salvage barn and coordinates our many hardworking volunteers on salvage efforts in the area. With every foot of salvaged floorboard or trim, every claw-footed bathtub or beautifully built-in cabinet Cabinet Friends promotes sustainability and keeps usable materials out of the landfill. And perhaps most importantly, a piece of our history is preserved. For 2019, Friends will continue to work with the Commission on Education and Preservation. And just as we advocated strongly for saving old brick back in 1975, which is why our organization was founded, we'll continue to advocate for saving historic treasures, like the 1843 Saxony Gilmore House on 109 Market. Please remember, every house and building in Iowa City has a story. If you'd like to help these homes continue to tell their stories, please consider joining the Friends of Historic Preservation and help us as we go forward in our mission. When you first came in, you were handed a program with a membership card. And if you're interested, please join us. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you all again for coming tonight. My name is Kate Corcoran. I'm a former member of the Iowa City Historic Preservation Commission and also a former member of the Friends of Historic Preservation. <clears throat> After we present the individual properties that are being recognized tonight, we would ask that each owner, as well as any consultants, contractors, carpenters, designers, painters, masons, and materials suppliers, please come to the table here at the front of the room to receive their awards. I have the pleasure tonight of giving out the Residential Paint and Exterior Finishes Awards. Our first award winner is 506 Brooklyn Park Drive. Owners Christina and Paul Leonard embarked on this project after noticing that a number of their home's features were showing their age. It's a craftsman-style bungalow in the cross-gabled roof form and is located on a street off Melrose Avenue on Iowa City's west side. The home is only one of a handful of craftsman-style bungalows that were built and occupied by Melrose area residents during the 1910s and 1920s. For the Leonards, the key to success was finding a contractor who got the importance of the character of a 100-year-old home. After discussions with McCarran Painting, they felt reassured and knew the company would handle the project with competence and care. The project included deteriorated, deteriorated window replacement and repair and repainting of the exterior trim. The McCarran team also reglazed the windows that did not need to be replaced. For reference, the Leonards had looked at a number of books about early 20th century craftsman style homes. Uh, 
They considered a number of possible color combinations, but in the end, decided to stay with the original scheme. Let's congratulate Christina and Paul Leonard and McCarran Painting. Our next award winner, yes, please come up. Sorry, I didn't know if you were here or not. Our next award winner is, is the home at 304 Brown Street. This home was built in 1909 and it's a large craftsman cottage that features wood shingle cladding, paired brackets, and exposed rafter rails. Tails, <laughs> forgive me. Owners Asha Bandri and Kumar Narayan have owned the home for five years. Even though they saw its grace and majesty shining through peeling paint, they knew it was time to take on the task of repainting. They s said it was an adventure to work with Wayne Nugel and his meticulous crew who peeled, scraped, and painted the house. The palette was inspired by the ochre of Asha's grandparents' home in central Finland. The red and dark brown colors were chosen to complement the patio, which is made of repurposed bricks original to the property. Asha and Kumar also had the storm windows painted dark, which harkens back to the painted wood storms that are traditional to the neighborhood. Congratulations to Asha Bandari and Kumar Narayanan and to Wayne Nugel of Classical Painting. Our next word winner is 1126 East College Street. This residence at 1126 East College Street was built in 1911. It's a large craftsman style bungalow in a two story, four square plan. It has a steep front gable with a single story side wing addition be beneath an extension of the main roof. The house has an interesting take on decorative siding, which changes at all three levels. You notice that the first floor is a standard lap siding with corner boards. The second floor is a narrow lap with beveled corners. And the attic level is shingled siding. Each level is separated by a band board. Owners Rebecca Raw and Thomas Oates decided on a color scheme of slate, blue, and white with traditional black window sashes, which you, can, you will see is a warm update from the previous buff and tan colors. McCarran Painting carefully undertook the preparation and painting of the house. Congratulations to owners Rebecca Raw and Thomas Oates and McCarran Painting. Our last award winner in this category is 220 North Dodge Street. The owner of 220 North Dodge Street is Mike Oliveira, who is no stranger to historic properties in Iowa City. When he purchased this single story 1882 cottage, there was considerable work necessary to bring it up to his current standards. The structure was in need of a new roof and expensive repair of the original wood siding. The brick foundation also leaked and needed to be sealed and tuck pointed. Once the repairs were completed, Mike worked with David Culbertson from Sherwin-Williams to choose the color scheme. In attempt to retain the era of the structure, they settled on a palette of sage and burgundy with a burgundy brown roof. You notice, whoops, sorry. I guess that was the last one. Sorry, just a sec. Forgive me. OK, just a sec. There. 
Notice the contrasting effect of the color achieved on the gables, which feature alternating sections of straight and fish scale shingles. Congratulations to Mike Oliveira of Prestige Properties, LLC, to consultant David Culbertson of Sherwin-Williams, and to contractor Prairie Sun Building Services. Again, congratulations to all our winners in the residential paint and exterior finishes category. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lee Shope. I'm a new member of the Historic Preservation Commission representing the Woodlawn District. Each year we are pleased to recognize rehabilitation products that recognize the character of the historic neighborhood and are sympathetic to the original property. The 1909 American Foursquare at 424 Davenport Street was accompanied by an original but heavily deteriorated 1912 garage. Over the years, neither the house nor the garage had, had been, um, had undergone any serious alterations. The historic garage was not only deteriorated significantly, collapsing inward, but like many others, had also built right on the property line. Replacement of the garage was needed and Wagner management was ready to replicate the garage. Frank Wagner, Wagner Brothers, ex exercised his thorough attention to detail in his reconstruction. Dutch or German lap siding was special ordered. Rafter tails and other detailing, as well as window and door replacement, carefully matched the original. The garage, new garage's placement, four feet west of the property line and five feet off the alley, enhanced the accessibility. Once the garage was completed, the house was refreshed with a new paint job to show off its original detailing, such as square paneled columns. Congratulations to owner Wagner Management and contractor Frank Wagner and Wagner Brothers LLC for the outstanding work. My neighbors, Jeff and Christine Denberg, have been long devoted to preserving Iowa City's history, and their 1926 bungalow on Grant Street is no exception. When they decided after owning the house for 20 years to rehabilitate the structure and matching garage, they reached out to the outstanding contractors and craftsmen for guidance and transformed a sleepy bungalow into a Longfellow jewel. With the removal of non-historic window awnings, a front porch enclosure and screen door, the original features of the house were revealed, divided three over one, double hung windows and brackets under the eaves, shingle siding and craftsman piers and columns. Art professor Joe Patrick consulted on the color palette. He deftly darkened the concrete block foundation while providing the neutral body color that allowed for the windows and rafters to be called out. Christine's attention to other details like powder coating existing railings, installing half round gutters, and refurbishing the screens and storms all added to the authenticity of the rehabilitation. <clears throat> On the interior, a bathroom was renovated with historic details and fixtures. The kitchen was remodeled to provide plenty of storage despite the small footprint with cabinets extended to the high ceiling. Congratulations to Jeff and Christine Denberg, Lammers Construction, Joseph Patrick, Scott Aarons, and Scott Aarons of Acoustical Painting. Howard Moffat and the houses he built in Iowa City are an important part of Iowa City's history. Situated on Rundell Street, so named after the streetcar line that dated back to 1910, Rebecca Entel's 1924 house is one of six houses on the east side of the street built by Moffat. 
Long ago, the original siding was replaced with press board siding, similar to masonite. The siding disguised the architectural character of the home and water, insects, and wildlife have been having a field day destroying it. Rebecca brought in Katie Lammers with Lammers Construction to complete the original, to complete the siding replacement project. While the house no longer had its original siding, the garage was clad with square shingle in alternating narrow and wide laps. Looking around the neighborhood, other Moffat homes had similar siding on the house and the garage. Rebecca was able to identify a cement board version of square single siding that would create recreate some of the original character of the house, but also resist future destruction by friendly neighborhood squirrels. We thank Rebecca and her contract, Katie, at Lammers Construction for a job well done. <laughs> 223 Seymour sits on a long block that has seen many projects this year. Across from Longfellow Elementary, built before 1920, this side gabled craftsman home has simple details of lap siding, a transverse porch with heavy columns, and of course, the broad, broad low-pitched roof of wood shingles. Owners Benjamin and Jennifer Lewis Partridge fretted that their shingle roof had finally, re had finally required replacement. Water damage had also become evident on some of the cedar siding, and the porch turned out to complete, be completely rotten through to the foundation. Mark Lyons, a roof rider, found appropriate cedar shakes for the roof. Painter Vinicio Hernandez Pacheco repaired the siding with matching cedar and painstakingly prepped and painted the entire house. We would like to recognize Benjamin, Jennifer Lewis Partridge, Jennifer, Benjamin and Jennifer Lewis Partridge, painter Vinicio Hernandez Pacheco, and Mark Lyons, a roof rider, for a job well done. Philip and Julie Ostrom, Ostrom had never owned a historic home or completed rehabilitation work before selecting 325 South Summit, the 1883 George Ball House, for their project. The plans were to convert the five apartment rental into an owner-occupied ground floor and two charming one-bedroom suites on the upper floor. Both the interior and the exterior required extensive rehabilitation. Hidden in a yard of overgrown brush, the house had asbestos siding, failing windows, missing porch columns, and no sense of the original architectural character. As the interior work began, the asbestos siding was removed, exposing the original five-inch clabbered and extensive trim detailing. Exterior window and door headers were, and sills were restored, the siding was repaired and painted, and the distinctive porch columns that had deteriorated beyond repair were miss, and were missing were retooled. The original standing room thief roof was resealed and half round gutters were painted. Original windows were reglazed with weights and pulleys restored. A reveal of the house was complete by the removal of scrub trees from the property, quite a project to undertake. I'm particularly impressed by these side windows that just really liven up the corner of that, of that side of the house. Congratulations go to Philip and Julie Ostrom and their fabulous crew of Keith Yenter, Patrick Montgomery of Projects with Patrick, Duane Fayo of Brush Brothers Painting, and Warren Hanlon of Hanlon Custom Woodworking. <laughs> Congratulations to all of our winners, winners in the category of housing rehabilitation.
Hello, my name is Cecile Kernsley, and I'm on the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, my duty tonight is to present the institutional rehabilitation projects, of which there were two. When property owners rehabilitate their larger institutional buildings with a sensitivity to their history, we recognize them for their effort. This year, as I said, we have two successful projects that have been completed uh, on this larger scale. Now, let's see if I can work this. No. Nope. What? Oh, not institutional? That's the additions one. First. Whoops, sorry. No problem. Okay. Okay. Um, this is eight, number eight Bella Vista Place. It was built in 1920 and situated on a high bluff at the end of North Lynn Street. It occupies a grand vista overlooking the Iowa River and City Park. In recent years, the house has undergone a series of modifications to make it more convenient uh, for current lifestyle needs. Recent work has included a front entry, whoops, um, go back, that front entry patio um, with a low brick wall. Um, but the latest change, and the one for which it's being recognized today, is a two-car garage What's going on? Wrong side. Nope. Going like this. OK. A two-car garage and a breezeway built to replace this small one-car garage that was built in 1925. Here's another view of the small garage and the entry to the house. And there's the new garage. Owners John and Kathy Courtney took care to incorporate design elements that would make the new garage relate better to the house architecture than did the 1925 garage. Um, you will notice that both the roof pitch and the shingles repeat the same roof pitch and shingles as on the house. Whoops, there we go again. Um, beadboard um, was used under the uh, house eaves. It's also used on the garage eaves. The couple found bricks in Pennsylvania that replicate those used on the house. And then the same stucco design feature of the house on the upper story is used in the garage construction. And to the right of the garage, a new pergola entry is paired with one on the back patio that visually unites the garage and the house. Masonry contractor John Bader and his wife painter Donna Bader and stucco master Bob Felton all exerted their skills to create the garage you see today. Congratulations to John and Kathy Courtney and John Bader, Donna Bader, and Bob Felton. Okay. Amending this relatively small house located at 306 Furson Street carried with it a weight of responsibility to do things right, as it was formerly the home of Iowa City home economics professor Margaret Keyes, who wrote the definitive book on Iowa City's 19th century architecture and who also served as the chief research consultant on the major renovation of the old Capitol building on the UI campus. The, in other words, the expert on how things architectural should be done correctly. The current owner, Sherry Cole, and contractor Russ Garrett of Garrett Construction collaborated to replace the original single car garage on the 1939 house with a large two car garage that would have access to the house interior. The single car garage did not have access to the house. The creation of a first floor laundry area in the house and a private patio with a pergola behind the house completed the project. The original garage windows and back door were salvaged and reused in the new garage's construction. Builders kept the roof line of the original garage but added wood shakes and a soffit line to the gable for some architectural interest. Half round copper gutters like those on the house were used for the garage. 
Salvaged Purington paver bricks were used for the patio floor. And cedar wood, whoops, where is it? Nope, I thought there was another slide. And cedar wood was used to make a privacy fence around the patio in the back. Scott Ahrens of Acoustical Painting tied everything together with a fresh coat of paint on both new and old. I think Miss Keyes would be pleased. Congratulations to Shelley Cole, Russ Garrett, and Scott Ahrens. Julie and Jason Hagedorn, with the assistance of ACAR architectural firm and contractor Al Ostegard, undertook a major facelift of the Marner House here, located at 211 Richard Street in Manville Heights. Built somewhere between 1900 and 1924, this four square had undergone serious modifications with a 1950s addition and carport on the east side of the house and the application of aluminum siding. The Hagedorn's objective was to achieve a more period-appropriate design that would make the house fit better into the neighborhood by removing that carport, removing the aluminum siding and the window shutters, and building a new front porch that would better fit the proportions of the house's facade and by building a new garage. On the back side of the house, a new deck and a three seasons room were constructed. Key elements that ensured historic and period accuracy included building a freestanding garage rather than an attached garage, which wouldn't have existed when this house was built, and by using the same roof pitch on the garage roof as is on the house. A new driveway, sidewalk, and landscaping finished up the project, and a new paint job brings the house to new life. Congratulations to Jason and Laurie Hagedorn, ACAR Architecture, and Al Ostegard. Fisher acted as the architect on this English cottage-style house located at 1201 Seymour, the home of her sister Karen and brother-in-law Brent Palmer. Contractor Brian Rule carried out her design. The project on this late 1930s cottage entailed removing an, an existing deck behind the house and replacing it with a 100-square-foot addition to the house to create a mudroom vestibule, expand the, uh, the kitchen, and create a screened-in back porch that you see here. There's the original, or not the original, but the deck that was removed. And here's the work in progress. Clad cedar shingles, like those on the rest of the exterior, were used to cover the new addition. The original kitchen cupboard doors were cleverly reused to create a back panel on the new kitchen island. An interior wall between the kitchen and the dining room was removed and replaced with an arch, repeating the arch between the living room and dining room, thereby opening up the interior space to more light. The addition and new screen-in porch on the back of the house tie in well with the gable cottage and add scale to the formerly monolithic two-story rear elevation. The 1930 house now has an updated interior and a more usable outdoor sitting area with the addition of that screened-in porch. Congratulations to Brent Palmer and Karen Fisher, Pamela Fisher, and Brian Rule of Rule Home Solutions. Okay, uh, congratulations to all our winners, winners in the category Additions and New Construction, and now I will talk about the category of institutional rehabilitation. So the story begins, the great effort begins with 1130 Seymour Street. It's a big year for Seymour Street. The story begins with the Longfellow neighborhood that loves its elementary school. 
When the community became aware of discussion to replace the school, they were determined to demonstrate how the facility is integrated into the community by planning events, neighborhood sledding party, family Valentine's Day dance, and even by, ta by taking advantage of its presence as the polling place for elections. At one of the neighborhood meetings, someone asked, what's more American than voting? Only to be answered, apple pie. And so friends and neighbors in the neighborhood organization organized to bake over 100 apple pies for election day and served every Longfellow voter a piece of pie free. Longfellow neighbors could not be ignored, and they championed preservation of their beloved elementary school. Recognizing community, invol community involvement, the Iowa City Community School engaged school designers, BCDM architects, who worked with the local firm Rohrbach Associates to preserve the historical look and exterior and interior in both existing buildings, while designing new construction to complement the school and the existing neighborhood. Restoration of the, this is the way it looked before they had at it. That's how it looked in 54, and you can see that the upper sashes have muntins in them. So restoration of the historic buildings included new six over one double hung and picture windows more reminiscent of the originals than the recent failing windows. To decrease the impact of the school on the uh, environment, a new geothermal heating system, cooling system, was installed that runs around the uh, perimeter of the playing field behind the school. The additions, classrooms, gyms, storage, and elevator, were constructed with complementary brick and banding, horizontal banding, that reflected the original building while creating a streamlined contemporary feeling. The massive piers between sets of windows found on the original building were also acknowledged in the design. You see the uh, very narrow vertical windows on this side on the left of the picture. The six over six casement windows were topped by a broad header emphasizing the horizontal features. The impact of the front facade of the original school, which faces east, was minimized. The additions are quietly set back and low in height, paying respect to the original front facade. A glass enclosed stairwell, which you see here as sort of a glass cube, was located on the back to provide greater accessibility. We are thankful that the school district recognized the importance of Longfellow Elementary th to the community and congratulate Greg Steeren and Bob Maybe of BCDM Architects, Will Downey of Rohrbach Associates, and Travis Schwartz of Larson Construction for the historically sympathetic rehabilitation and additions to Longfellow School. And I must tell you, when, we had the, when they held the open house, I think the whole neighborhood turned out and people were just, jaw, just jaws were dropping to see what they had done. I urge you to stop in sometime and have a look for yourselves. This is 404 East Jefferson Street, AKA St. Paul's Lutheran Church. St. Paul's Lutheran <clears throat> is a Tudor revival style church built in 1926 and gracing Jefferson Street Historic District. Over the past few years, the congregation has undertaken an exhaustive effort to rehabilitate many aspects of the chapel. The first phase involved the replacement of the coping stones lining the top of the parapet end walls. The stones had been crumbling, and Midwest Masonry undertook this monumental task. The second phase involved the roof and dormers. Brecht construction replaced the aging roof, while at the same time replacing and repairing the distinctive six-paned casement windows and creating Tudor-style panels in the smaller front dormer. Another portion of this phase involved the large window in the rear-facing gable of the sanctuary. This window had been leaking for years and was blocked by the organ on the interior. This east gable window arrangement was completely rebuilt with a panel and attached mullion and muntin bars to replicate the multi-paned windows that originally occupied that space. Finally, for the third and final phase, 
Edwards' painting climbed the bell tower to paint the infill panels black, helping them recede in space and add to the illusion that they are open. They also painted the imitation multi-paned window and both Tudor-style dormers. This is the first time in decades that the dormers have matched. We would like to recognize the owners, Iowa District East, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and Pastor Max Mons, Edwards Painting, Brecht Construction, and Midwest Masonry Restoration for their outstanding work. So congratulations to all our winners in the category Institutional Re uh, Rehabilitation. And thus, I end my part of the program. Ah, man at work. Okay, I'm back. Sometimes uh, we have projects that we're made aware of that don't fit uh, in our traditional or conventional award categories but are worthy of recognition. Uh, and sometimes that project is just a small, uh, a small thing or a detail or something unglamorous. Like I think last year we had the repair of an internal gutter system, which one can only appreciate if you were up there doing it, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, it's something like a railing, or in this case this year, uh, it's a fence. So on our award winner here is 431 Brown Street, uh, which is Devin Redman and Lynn Simmons, uh, neighbors of mine. And sometimes fixing a fence is a job, and sometimes it's a heart-wrenching, back-breaking back excuse me, trial that inspires a writing project. Devin Redman and Lynn Simmons undertook a fence repair project this summer that had a novella written all over it. Their house at 431 Brown Street is a 1920 shingle-clad four-square with a more rectangular plan than most. Their existing fence reflected that rec rectangularity uh, and the craftsman touches in its cottage detailing. It, however, leaned a bit too heavily past the definition of weathered uh, to remain any longer. The new fence is made of cedar and the recycled stainless steel screws from the previous iteration. It is also a more modern interpretation of the original. Devin writes, this fence project makes me want to cry, yell, laugh, and kick things all at once. Getting the previous cement holders out is no joke, but it takes as much planning to get a new one poured. How is a skyscraper ever built? Uh, probably not by the homeowners, I'm guessing, right? So, congratulations, Devin Redman and Lynn Simmons. You made it. Uh, and um, I'll welcome Jennifer Price uh, with the Johnson's County Historic Preservation Commission, who will present their award for stewardship. Do I just press the arrow? Use the mouse with the silver icon. Is it there? This one. Hello, I'm, I'm Jennifer Price. I'm the chair of the Johnson County Historic Preservation Commission. And this year we have um, one award for stewardship. Um, it's St. Peter and Paul Chapel right near Solon. And this is, this is it. It's, it's in the middle of a rural, a rolling rural landscape. So it's very surprising when you come upon it. St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church was first organized in 1861 by the Czech Bohemian immigrants who settled around Solon and Mount Vernon. The original stone church was located across the road from the present church next to the cemetery. When the congregation grew too large, the second and present church, designed by architect R.K. Parkinson, was built on donated land and dedicated in 1917. This is a view from toward the Northwest. For many years, the church was the hub of activities in this rural neighborhood. It was a place for weddings, solitude, funerals, and the celebration of sacraments. Corpus Christi Day was an annual celebration held after Easter. Over the decades, however, after people moved away from the farms to the cities with their families, the congregation dwindled. The Catholic diocese finally closed the church in, on June 30th, 1996. The following year, Saints Peter and Paul Chapel was listed on the National Register. 
for its ethnic heritage and architectural significance. Saints Peter and Paul Catholic Church was the first Bohemian Czech congregation in Iowa. Even in 1916, when this church was under construction, sermons were preached in the Czech language. The cemetery across the road continues to be used by descendants of this ethnic community. As for its architecture, the church exhibits the Romanesque revival style with its round arched windows and twin offset tower facade, an outstanding design for a country church, according to the nomination. It combines a Gothic style with round arched and rectangular windows which reflect the academic interest, interest in historical styles at the time. The twin tower format is a minor type in America, but there is a group of these churches in eastern Iowa, at least seven of them, that is probably unique in America. A type that was brought here by German settlers and reflects the German ethnicity and training of early architects working in Iowa. You don't expect the interior when you walk in. <laughs> Each stained glass window in the church was donated by a Czech parishioner and has Czech inscriptions underneath. The Carrera marble altar, which features the Last Supper, carved into the front, was shipped from Italy. The infant Jesus of Prague, a Czech religious symbol, adorns the altar. The 1861 painting of Saints Peter and Paul in the vestibule was brought over from Europe. All of these, most of these adornments were acquired during the height of World War I. The financial and physical care of this rural church property is in the hands of the St. Peter and Paul Historical Foundation, a group of former church members organized after the church closed. Rather than see the church torn down, the group formed a foundation and board to lead the fundraising drive, purchase the property from the diocese, and restore and renovate the building. Indoor plumbing was installed for the first time, and a new downstairs kitchen made it possible to cater large gatherings. Construction of a ramp, for, for accessibility meant everyone could attend. Everything in the altar area was cleaned and painted, and the stained glass windows were restored. The St. Peter and Paul Historical Foundation receives its main source of income through wedding rentals and a fall auction on the third Sunday of September. The foundation also receives general and memorial donations, which are invested, and the foundation has been named as beneficiaries in a few wills and trusts. Minor maintenance is performed by, mainly by volunteers. Although larger maintenance projects require professionals, much of the materials are usually donated. Recent projects have included a new roof, new parking lot pavement, and a newly drilled well after the old one collapsed last summer. The Historical Foundation also keeps in touch with the community by having a few annual events. Each May or June, a mass for Corpus Christi is held in the cemetery. They're not allowed to do it in the church. Um, which was an annual event in the former parish since his organization in 1861. On the second Sunday of December, the foundation hosts a sing-along Christmas caroling event in the chapel, after which families enjoy cookies and hot cocoa and Santa's visit for the youngsters in the downstairs hall. The foundation also sponsors a free Red Cedar Chamber music concert each year with the social, hall, social hour in the hall afterwards. The Johnson County Historic Preservation Commission is pleased to present this award to the Saints Peter and Paul Historical Foundation for their exceptional stewardship and preservation of this historic church and landmark in Johnson County. So in case you have not had enough of me, I am back, back for more. Um, our uh, last category is stewardship. Um, and stewardship in, for these awards, two left. Well, I'm not thinking the other one is the final category, but we can argue over that afterwards. Uh, stewardship represents, uh, for this commission, a profound commitment. And Jeff and Christine Denberg are shining examples of Iowa City community members who have committed themselves to historic preservation. Their record of maintenance on six historic homes began with the purchase of 1011 Woodlawn. 
This stately Italian at home has been, had been restored by Sandra Eskin as one of the three houses she acquired in an effort to save the Woodlawn Enclave. Christine became deeply impressed by the restoration, recollecting, as I lived in the home, enjoying the restoration and preservation work that had been done before our occupancy, it inspired me to follow in her commitment to caring for my elderly home and rental homes and tackle important but sometimes unsexy repairs that are critical for the long and healthy life of an older historic home in addition to the importance of preserving design elements. This journey included education from National Preservation Briefs of the National Park Service, reviews by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, state and city grants, counseling from the Iowa City Historic Preservation Commission, help from Friends of Historic Preservation, there's a lot of acronyms here, and City of Iowa City Inspectors and Community Development Department. While we've already celebrated the rehabilitation of 708 Grant Street tonight, I'd like to call out some of the key examples of Jeff and Christine's investment in the community. And I'd like to note that the focus of their work in the Longfellow and Rundell Street neighborhoods has enhanced each neighborhood. For their own home at 1011 Woodlawn, which they've owned for 26 years, you should really have us like run all of your PowerPoint presentations, I think. Uh, uh, they own for 26 years. They replaced the 100-year-old metal roof when it was damaged by hail with an historically accurate standing seam roof. After the 2006 tornado, they worked with the State Historic Preservation Office to restore and repair the house, including rebuilding three chimneys, repairing the standing seam roof, and restoring landscaping. They meticulously prepared siding prior to a four-color repainting of the house that was directed by Joe Patrick. They've also updated by adding electricity to the barn on site so an electric car can be charged. Three houses in Longfellow, 707 Rundell, 1601 Center, and of course 708 Grant have undergone extensive rehabilitation projects in the past few years. These projects have included maintaining and repairing porches and windows, tuck pointing masonry and painting. In fact, 707 Rundell is in the middle of its painting project. And the interiors of these houses have also been rehabbed with historic detailing restored and kitchens and bathrooms remodeled. 1224 Muscatine is their most recent purchase. When you've seen. Uh, and another uh, bungalow gem. While it hasn't needed much work, it has also been thoughtfully maintained. Finally, 510 North Dodge. Uh, 510 North Dodge is a property a bit further afield from the others. And like the others, it has non historic elements that need a little work to help its historic character come through. We're sensing that it might be the next project. Christine has already been reaching out and researching the possibilities, and we wouldn't be surprised if it suddenly began to shine a little bit brighter. We congratulate Jeff and Christine Denberg for their dedication to historic preservation and contributions to our community, and we look forward to their continuing efforts being part of future awards. Thank you. Lastly, uh, I'm proud to present the Margaret Novish Award. Margaret was the first chair of the Historic Preservation Commission when it was established in 1983. This award is not presented every year, but rather when an individual comes to our attention who's made a particularly substantial contribution to the cause of preservation. And this year, it's my pleasure to recognize Ginnelly Swain with this award. Ginnelly Swain was the chair of the Iowa City Historic Preservation Commission from 2012 to June of 2018. She had been on the commission since 2006 and was previously on the commission from 1993 to 1997, a total of 16 years. With her commission term expiring this past year, we've reflected on the work she's done and continues to do, and that's why we've chosen to recognize her with the Margaret Novish Award. When Ginnelly first came to the commission in 1993, she worked at the State Historical Society of Iowa as historical editor of the Iowa History Magazine. And by this time, Ginnelly already had a history of volunteer work in preservation. Throughout her initial term, the commission continued an annual awards program and continued the completion of several neighborhood historic surveys by consultants. Both a excuse me, conservation district overlay designation and a local landmark designation were added to the Iowa City Zoning Ordinance. In 1996, the commission worked through the complicated politics of designating 36 local landmarks. During this active period, Ginnelly served as a commissioner, honing her skills in neighborhood and city politics and gaining an understanding of the power of local preservation regulation. 
Following the completion of her term in 1997, Jen Lee stayed active in local preservation. She served on the board of Friends of Historic Preservation, uh, something that she is again doing now, and was a member of the Iowa Historic Preservation Alliance. Despite this involvement, she was acutely aware of the public's frequent misconceptions about preservation and wanted to use her writing and ed editing talents for public education. In 2006, she applied for another position on the Iowa City Historic Preservation Commission, becoming the chair of the commission in 2012. Advocacy is the hallmark of Jenna Lee's term as chairperson. In her first year, she worked tirelessly to promote the designation of the local Jefferson Street Historic District. While the Jefferson Street District is small, it had few owner-occupied properties or supporters of the designation. Jenna Lee went door-to-door -door in the district and neighboring areas to educate people on the neighborhood and the local designation process. She organized supporters so the city council meeting for the designation had a standing room only crowd, which I think was my first experience with preservation in Iowa City. And she organized supporters so at the city council meeting, oh, excuse me, a first for our local preservation community. The local historic district overlay ordinance needed a super majority to pass, but passed unanimously. And I'll say on a personal note that uh, I've always and continue to admire Jenna Lee's poise, elo eloquence, and conviction and diplomacy uh, in her public comments. Two years later, a group of property owners in another Northside neighborhood petitioned the commission to create a conservation district in their neighborhood. The area included Iowa City's oldest neighborhoods known for their vernacular cottages and a school-based neighborhood of larger stately homes. Jenna Lee was instrumental, an instrumental component in the resolution of the contentious area into a combined neighborhood that unanimously passed as the Goosetown Horace Mann Conservation District. Jenna Lee Swain has also been an advocate for commission staff. Budget cuts had reduced an already minimal staff position to less than half time and from permanent to consulting at the beginning of Jenna Lee's chairmanship. Jenna Lee's ardent support and communication with the mayor and city council had helped gain some ground. We're not done yet, sorry. And returned the position to half time and permanent. She also pushed for resolutions supporting grant applications and matching funds. Perhaps the most beneficial aspect of Jenna Lee's dedication was her availability to staff for project discussions and approvals. She met with council members, the mayor, and local preservationists with great regularity and appeared to drop everything to answer the call when she was needed. Jenna Lee's dedication to Iowa City's cultural heritage did not diminish in her last year on the commission. She's been an integral force in promoting a potential downtown historic district, helping acquire funding from the city council for a historic survey, meeting with consultants and property owners, and educating the public. She continued the process of local landmark designation for a group of unprotected properties and has also worked to protect Iowa City's oldest house from demolition and has been successful in preventing its relocation to a nearby historic district, which endangered the integrity of the house, the district, and the historic courtyard where it would sit. For generally, retirement from the commission does not necessarily mean that we have to lose her powerful and respected voice. She will continue to be active in the community because Jenna Lee Swaim can never really be removed from the heart of Iowa City Historic Preservation. She is recognized with the Margaret Novish Award for her years of invaluable service to Iowa City. This award only begins to acknowledge the impact her leadership has had on our community. So Jenna Lee, congratulations and thank you very much. lovely um, you know there's only one name on this but anybody who's in preservation know that knows that there's never only one person accomplishing something so I've got to tip my hat to um, to the commission that I served with and to the uh, staff and to the Planning and Zoning Commission and to the City Council who really understand what preservation is and how it can work and why it's good for Iowa City. And I've got to tip my hat to Friends of Historic Preservation who's been in this business since 1975 as a nonprofit, and to people like you who take the time and care enough to speak up when there's something that we really have to speak up about. And I especially want to tip my hat to the person who first got me into preservation, which is Sandy Zoe Eskin. Um, uh, Christine mentioned her influence, too, um, when I was 
an early homeowner and a young mom and didn't know anything about this, Sandy started dragging me into <laughs> the idea of preservation and got me to write a letter and talk to the city council, which was terrifying at that time, and um, I owe a lot to her. The other thing that's cool about preservation for me is that you get to learn so much stuff. You get to learn history, which is my first love, and you get to learn about architecture and construction and design, and you get to learn what contributes to a sense of place. And you get to work with people who are skilled and committed and really interesting, and you get to help figure out what... Um, what we really value and what that common ground is and how we can safeguard those values. So I have a granddaughter who is my partner in adventures, and sometimes I drive by historic houses, and when she's in the car with me and I pull over and I wax eloquent on this particular house or that particular house and why it's important. And sometimes I get kind of fervent about it. <laughs> And to the point that the other day she said, Nana, houses are not alive. <laughs> well, you know, in a way they are. Because people infuse life into a house. They do it when they first design and build a house. And they do it when they live in a house. And they do it when they keep a house in good health and good repair. And they do it when they pass it on to another generation. And I believe all of us preservationists in this room, in this community, keep our houses alive as well, not only by protecting them through preservation, but by keeping them relevant to life today and keeping them useful for the whole community. And for that, um, thanks for carrying the torch with me. Thank you. I get to go to this slide now, I think. So um, thank you all for coming. There are um, floors to be scraped and siding to be scraped and repainted and um, new electrical hookups for your barn, for your new electric cars to be installed. So good luck with all of your projects over the course of the year. We look forward to rewarding your hard work next year. So thanks, and have a wonderful evening, everybody.